Genesis chapter 1 as we begin our series on creation. This is creation month and so we're going to focus throughout the entire month on what the Lord has done through creation because this doctrine is under attack and of course the first chapter of the Bible is under attack and the first verse is under attack and so we're going to strengthen these things. This is a foundation of our faith that God is our creator and our judge. Let's go ahead and start in verse number 1. Genesis 1 verse number 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. That statement right there that God created is offensive to the public school system. It is offensive to science, falsely so called, as we talked about last Sunday night in uh, the evolutionary theory. Um, God created all things. In the beginning, God created. The goal here is to give God the glory for what He has done. And we're going to dig into the scriptures and we're going to look at some very key words right here in day number one as we focus on the few things that God did, but that but the, what power and weight they had as we began with day number one. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would help us to better understand what you've done for us. Lord, we love you and we believe that the Bible is true. We believe that you have truly created all things and that means that we're responsible to you. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit right now. I pray that you would help me to expound the scriptures and I pray that you would help your people to better understand, to see it clearly. And I ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Again, Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. This is important. God is the creator. God was not created. God has always existed. And if God is the creator, that means he is the final authority and he is the judge of your soul. And this is why a lot of people hate the young earth creation view. They do not want to believe that they are responsible for their actions. But the Bible tells us something different. A God that created everything that was outside of creation. He obviously was pre-existing. A God that is eternal. A God without a beginning or an ending. Uh, there's a Bible term that's often used. It says from everlasting, that God himself is from everlasting. And uh, just to give you some visuals, I'm going to uh, draw some pointers for you today. And this is the basis of the Bible. This is the basis of all of our faith. It is God. In Psalm 90, it says, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth, and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. God is from everlasting. He is outside of time. He is not bound by time. He is not constrained by the dimension of time. In fact, time is his creation. We'll see that. If you would, go to Genesis chapter 2. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse number 4. Head that way. In Micah 5, it says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of these shall come forth unto me he that is to be ruler in Israel, whose, going, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. So God is from everlasting. He is before time ever started. This is important. You're in Genesis 2. Look at verse number 4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So this is the account. This is the record. God's going to tell us what he did. If you would, go to Romans chapter 1. Go to Romans chapter 1. The most important foundation that we see in Genesis 1-1 is God. And the world hates it. It is under attack by uh, science falsely so-called. In fact, evolution is a pseudo-scientific system, and it is designed by the core. It is designed to deny the existence of God and thereby attempt to ignore the eternal judgment of the soul that is to come for all of us. And that is the, in the intent and the purpose of it. And the evolutionary theory of the origin of life is a ridiculous religious doctrine. It is political. It is religious. They have faith in it. And that teaching is essentially this, that nature created itself. Now the Bible says, in the beginning, God created. So either nature created itself somehow, spontaneously, or God, who has intelligence, designed something and then made it happen, and we are the product 
of what he designed. Their purpose of teaching evolutionary theory is to basically to make you think everything is seemingly random and meaningless. It's just a series of meaningless events until the end of your days when you're consumed, but that's not true. You're in Romans chapter 1, find verse number 20. Romans chapter 1, look at verse number 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What's he saying? The invisible things of him from the creation of the world. You understand, you have an invisible soul. You have an invisible spirit. What, what is who you really are is invisible to the flesh. We see the flesh and oftentimes we're blinded by the elements, we're deceived by our own eyes and we judge unrighteous judgment. But he's saying here that we as human beings are without excuse to our Creator. We know that there is something more than just our flesh. It's written in our nature. That light is in all of us when we're born. Notice he says that they're being understood by the things that are made. We are made by Him, and we see that in everything there is a Creator. Uh, everything that we see had a design. It was planned. It was implemented. It was created. It was made. And that is the case in human life, and so is it in all of the world and heaven and earth as well. This is God's design. And He says, look at it, at the end of that verse in Romans 1.20, He says, even His eternal power, recognizing that God has the authority, and Godhead, a demonstration of who he is, so that they are without excuse. The evolutionist or the atheist that says, well, I don't believe in God. I don't trust the Bible. Well, they are without excuse. God presents himself in their soul. He demonstrates himself in all of creation. And common sense itself would cause you to say, somebody bigger than me has made me. And thereby, we are responsible to God as well. The evolutionary scientists in the 1800s as they began developing these theories, they literally were dabbling in the occult. They publicly and openly uh, have sworn allegiance to satanic secret societies. They publicly stated that God is their enemy and they want to eliminate all mention of God. And that is the result if you look at the textbooks of today. Uh, if you would go back to Genesis chapter 1. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. The agenda of evolution is to teach your children that spiritual authority and parental authority is irrelevant, that uh, you should make your own decisions and selfish living is preferred. And yet, in their science, they also say that human beings are a cancer on the earth, that our very existence and our breathing is destroying Mother Earth, and it, it's a very confusing cult with fake science. I want to show you in Genesis 1.1, we're going to see the Godhead. It says that they're without excuse of the Godhead. We see it right here in chapter 1. Look at Genesis 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's the heavenly Father. Look at verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There's the Holy Ghost mentioned in verse number 2. Look at verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now we're dealing with the Word of God, the Son of God, if you would go to John 1.1. 1, 1. He said that we're without excuse when we look at creation to the knowledge of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And we know that these three are one. And we are very limited in our perception of dimensions. And we are in 3D, yea, four dimensions when we look and consider time. And when God presents Himself, He represents Himself in such a way that our small little brain can try to understand who He is. But God is so so much bigger than we will ever be able to comprehend as long as we're in human flesh. In Hebrews 11 it says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. You understand it was God that is invisible that made everything that we see. And by this we understand it was framed, it was formed by the Word of God. You're in John 1.1. 1, 1. Look at verse 1 there. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and 
Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. All men are born with light. We have light inside of us. God has given us life. He breathed light into our nostrils. Jesus Christ, the Word of God, is the Word of God. Look at verse 14 in that chapter. John 1, verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. There is Jesus Christ. He became flesh. Go to John, 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, if you would. 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, all the way in the back, right before Revelation. And we'll see this also, the third verse, the third mention of in the beginning. We're dealing with the Son of God as the Word of God. He is our Creator and our Savior. When you get to 1 John 1, look at verse number 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. These are the disciples making the statement, we have literally handled the word of life. We have handled the word of God, the Son of God. And if you remember uh, uh, what Jesus said to Thomas, uh, uh, reach hither thy finger, reach, reach hither thy hand, and uh, you know, feel the hole in my side. Jesus was telling them, literally, they handled the word of life, Jesus Christ. Go back to Genesis 1. Remembering in Romans 1 that we saw, that it's the invisible things of the creation. That God makes this manifest and real, and we should understand that it's true, and the world is without excuse of God and the Godhead. And we understand it when we look around that everything we see was made by somebody. And so we are without excuse, especially of His creation. Now you're back in Genesis 1.1. Again, let's read it. It says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, this is interesting, in the beginning. So here's an important detail about this. There is a beginning of time. In the beginning, God created the heaven, let's call that the heaven, and the earth. This is just a two-dimensional drawing. Uh, so in the heaven we have Space. This is the area that God created and ordained that everything would be made. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And matter. The heaven is the area He created everything. The earth is the matter that He created. Heaven was the realm. He kind of drew the boundaries and said, here's where I'm drawing and creating inside of it. He puts the earth. And what you have here is time, space, and matter. And most of you may recognize this as uh, the time-space continuum. That these three elements are necessary for all things. And one cannot exist without the other. In fact, uh, one cannot exist prior to the other. When God did what He did, He was so brilliant and so genius in everything that He's created. He, and we'll learn as we get into Genesis 2 that He designed it in heaven first, uh, in, in, in His realm, and then He created it down here. He had a perfect design. Everything uh, happened by purpose. It was not by accident. It is very intentional. It is extremely designed. And everything He did was perfect and good. And so what does He do? He created creates an area for everything that he'll make. And inside of that area, he puts the elements. And so when he creates time, note this is the first 24-hour day. This is the first day. We'll see that as we get to verse 5. Uh, this is the beginning. Uh, it was the, uh, the first day. But then he says, when he says heaven, this is where all creation will exist and exists even yet today. But then when it gets to earth, this is kind of interesting. Um, I call this the construction supplies. Right? This is where he puts everything that he would use to begin to make everything else. This is like the raw materials. If you guys have ever seen a construction job starting, a truck backs up, and they offload, and here's a bunch of timbers, and then here comes some stones, and then here's maybe your hardware and fasteners, and all the equipment, everything, the tools, everything that you need, they begin to lay all of that out first before they start uh, building something. And so it's interesting, God creates this time-space continuum. All three of these work together uniquely. And earth is 
sort of without um, design yet. But notice this is the first day, in the beginning. If there is a beginning, logic would tell you there must be an end. I will tell you there was a beginning of time for us and earth, and there will be a last day of earth one day. In 2 Peter 3 it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. God is saying, one day I created it, and one day I will destroy it all. The entire earth and heaven as he's created it will melt, it'll burn, and it will be gone. So this is a warning that we are responsible to God. So when he says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Let's focus on the heaven for just a minute. Uh, and this is important because every major critical Bible version changes this verse. Yea, they change this word of heaven. They change it to heavens. If you're ever in a hotel and you have a Gideon's Bible there and you want to see is this a real Bible or is this a modified uh, Catholic influenced Bible, just go to Genesis 1-1 and if it says in the beginning God created the heaven, you've got a legitimate source. If it says heavens, you have something that is critical of the text. It creates a contradiction because God will separate the heaven into heavens, plural. We'll see this as we get into uh, day number two in the sermon this evening, okay? Uh, but So we'll touch it briefly, but wouldn't that be a contradiction if God creates the heavens and then he creates the heavens? No. The text says God created the heaven, and then he divides the heavens. We see in 2 Corinthians 12, chapter 2, that God says, uh, he uses the phrase, one that was caught up unto the third heaven. Well, that's God's throne. It's called paradise in verse number 4 of that text. That's what Jesus said from the cross. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. He used the same phrase in Revelation of the tree of life that is in Paradise, which is where God's throne is at. So the third heaven is where God will choose to dwell. That's where the angels are at. That's where your soul goes when you die. That heaven is the third heaven. And again, I'll map this out a little bit more with the heavens as we get into day two this evening. For now, I'll just uh, give you that glimpse of it. Continuing. Genesis 1-1. Again, you guys are going to have this verse memorized by the end of the day. Lord willing, okay? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Which, by the way, if you don't have a Bible that says heaven, uh, get one. That's very important. We have free Bibles, right? In the, in, and the earth. Let's focus on the raw material. The construction resources, I like to call it. The supplies. The dirt, the rocks, the clay, the gems, the crystals. Uh, the gases, the waters, the acids, the lava, the sand, the mud, all of that was uh, put here. You could say dumped off, but God's probably a, a little more thorough in what he does. Even in staging his construction site, I'm sure there was somewhat of order. However, it was without form and void, right? God had not yet, not yet built anything. He was preparing his work. So let's look at verse number two. And the earth was without form and void. This is important. Uh, if you, if they, you're going to build a house, they set up the foundation material, the trusses, the bricks, everything's getting ready, but there's no walls yet, there's no roof, there's no rooms built. Without form and void. Form would be you put the walls on. The void would be that empty space, the hollow of the room, okay? And there are voids in the earth such as caves and caverns and aquifers and all sorts of things uh, but the earth at this point was still without form and void on day one God had not yet molded it the way that he would design it to last and I have to make mention here uh, because this is a uh, especially with the advent of the internet heresy becomes more and more popular they, they revive these old heresies who here has heard of the gap theory I have to bring it up the gap theory uh, there is a theory out there, and I, some people are well-meaning when they teach it. I think others are intentional, intentionally evil. But you have a theory that in between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, there's a pause, therefore there is a gap. And what people are trying to do is say, well, it's not really a young earth creation. There are millions of years inserted in between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. But the Bible does not teach that. 
The Bible does not say that anywhere at all. Some people will even go as far to say that there was a pre-Adamic race of human beings, and they were so evil that God destroyed them, and that's why in verse number two it's without form and without void. The best reference I've seen anybody use, which is not a legitimate reference, is in Jeremiah chapter 4, where in Jeremiah 4, it's a reference to the city of Jerusalem being destroyed, and it's that destruction, and things are in disarray, and it uses the phrase without form and void. But there are walls and rubble, and there are birds and animals, and there are things still happening in the chapter, if you take it in context, that it is simply not a creation reference. So I think it is error, yea, I think it's heresy, to try to say that there was an, an, an existing race of people that was destroyed before Adam. When God says the beginning, and when he says he created time, God knows what he's teaching. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ said, are there not 12 hours in a day? Didn't he say that? There are 12 hours in the day, there are 12 hours in the night, and for anybody to add in between Genesis 1 and 2, they make day one last millions or billions of years, and then all of a sudden the other days begin to get more closer to a 24-hour view. So this is a, a very dangerous teaching, and I do reject the gap theory. Uh, if you have a hankering to believe it, I'm not going to call you a heretic, but I do want you to know the origins of it. I believe it comes from mysticism at its roots. I do not believe it is a Christian doctrine by any means. While we're here in verse number two, he says, the earth was without form and void. Some people are confused about void. I've heard people teach a hollow earth theory based on that, that there are people living inside the earth. You know, it says dwellers in the earth elsewhere, and it's like, well, it's not really what it says, okay? Let's, I mean, the Bible is accurate. The King James Bible is a very sharp sword, but let's not strain it in that so much that we go cross-eyed and we can't see uh, beyond our, our nose, okay? Uh, but when it says void, I often think of negative space, right? Negative space, a Bible synonym that's word used for void is emptiness. Void means emptiness. So if I speak of this room that we're in, the sanctuary, uh, this is form, and this air over here, this is the void. Does that make sense? And so that's what God is referring to. It was without that uh, a successful design yet because God had not finished it yet. It was formless. It was shapeless until day number three when God created dry land. In fact, look at Genesis 1, verse number 9. Find verse number 9. And God said... Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth. So earth there is referring to the dry dirt. Now there are many things in the earth, and we'll, again, we'll deal with that as we move forward in creation, but I did just want you to see that, that it's day three that he actually begins to form it and shape it. Until then, it is shapeless and formless. Continuing in verse number 2, let's read the whole verse this time. Genesis 1, 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So here we see dark. Now dark is the absence of light. If we turn out all the lights in here, uh, you men with a flashlight, well you better get ready, right? Uh, of course we do have a a window in here, but if it were in the middle of the night and all the lights go out, it would be the absence of light and just a little bit of light would help. And so darkness was something God created because he's going to create light to contrast it. But notice he says waters. Water was created on day number one. Right here we see it. Now what's interesting, we see that heaven is dark and earth by default is wet. The earth is wet. It's a deep with waters. The Spirit of God moves over it before He forms it into something. We know there's uh, land and minerals and all sorts of other things in there, but before He forms it, it is water. Now, who knows what percentage of the earth, how, what percentage of it is water? Any guesses? 70? Yeah, about 70 percent or more, right? So it is mostly water. The earth, generally speaking, is wet, just like our human body, and heaven generally speaking, is mostly dark. If you think of a star field, uh, the star shines because it's on darkness. It has darkness 
surrounding it, okay? Uh, so that is an important thought. Now what's interesting, and as we go through the days, I'm going to touch on some of the evolutionary theories that are commonly taught. Um, here we have, think about this, this is mostly water, and we'll get into the heavens and the waters, but think about Earth as mostly water, and it's just kind of a blob. It's a formless, uh, it's a location, all the matter is there. It's not really shaped yet, all right? Um, I'm not saying it's a flat Earth. We'll talk about the, the, the shape of the Earth in time, uh, but uh, it's all kind of there. Now, evolution teaches primordial soup. Who's heard of this? primordial soup, okay, and what they teach is everything, first it exploded, you know, and then there were these certain gases that came together and it was turning liquid and they had some matter and some minerals and it's always like, well, where'd that come from? Because I believe in the beginning God created. Well, here, let's just call it that for a second. Primordial means from the beginning, right? So in the beginning we had an area that was full of a bunch of liquid and minerals. Now what did not happen was we didn't have a worm crawl out and turn into a toad or a lizard that turned into a fish and then a monkey and then a man. That's not how it went down. That's a lie against God. The truth is God started with some resources and we see it all right here in the first day. I'm not going to call it a primordial soup as the evolutionists do, but you see how they try to steal from what God has done. The devil will tell you lies, and when he comes to tell you a lie, believe me, he will come with some truth. Isn't that just like rat poison? Most of your rat poison is good, healthy food with just a little bit of fluoride in it, just enough fluoride to kill you. And that's how they kill the rats, and that's how the devil wants to catch the Christian or uh, the unbeliever, the children of the world. He wants to convince them of a lie. And yeah, you know, there is evidence of a primordial soup. It's called, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void, right? And there was a deep, there was waters, and it was all in one location until God made something out of it. And God did create out of those minerals that he created there, but things did not evolve on their own. Nature did not design itself. Nature did not create itself. Nature did not mold itself. We do not answer to nature with our soul. Look at verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. This is a powerful statement, verse 4. And God said, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Notice here, God sees the light that he creates, and we're going to get back to light in just a minute. But he sees the light that he creates, and what does he call it? Good. Here, God creates good. Day number one, God creates things that are good good for our sake, for our own blessing, he'll go on and tell us. But then he begins to divide the light from the dark. You know, God creates division. God does create division and separation for discernment and for sanctification. This is a godly principle all the way back on day number one. Look at verse five. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. God creates all the energy that would ever be needed, he, and he calls it light. And he does have a separation of night and day. Now, we know that he'll create the sun, moon, and stars and set them in order so that we can perceive the days and the years and the signs and the seasons. That's the purpose on day four, but we're not there yet, and God has already created light and darkness and created a separation, and he calls it a day and a night. Again, a 24-hour, literal, day and night. That's how he started on day number one. And you say, well, how can that be? How can we have day and night without the sun, moon, and stars? It's almost like the ingenious watchmaker puts all the perfectly gears together. All the gears are in place, and he's just waiting to put the hands on the face of the watch. But everything is already built on the inside. God has created it. He's laying his foundation. He's taking his time for a reason, to teach us a lesson. If God wanted to, he wouldn't even need 24 hours to create it all. I often wonder, how long did it take? I mean, he, he could have just said, made a statement and everything existed. I wonder if he was speaking it and then watching as everything developed. What did God do with his spare time? I don't know. We'll find out when we get to heaven. I'm very curious about creation. There's so much great information just in these first five verses. 
God created light. This is so important. Light represents all energy that will ever be necessary to fuel, to fund the earth for as long as it will exist. Light, as many of you probably know, is an electromagnetic spectrum. There is not, we think of visible light. If we turn off the lights, there is, there is still light transmitting. That Wi-Fi router is transmitting light. I want you to understand, light that is visible to human beings is in a very small spectrum. It's very small. What is it? Red, orange, yellow, green, violet. Does that sound right? Right? So there's only certain lights that we can see. Outside of that, there's an enormous amount of electromagnetic energy that is called light. It is energy that travels. And with it, there's matter. And these things work and coexist in a way that we do not understand. The fastest anything can move in the universe is the speed of light. This is how God created things. And scientists of the day, they'll say, well, we know what light is. We can observe this and we see that, but we don't know where it comes from or how to slow it down. We don't exactly know what it's doing, but we can see it and we can use it. It's very interesting that in the beginning when God created, he said, let there be light. That one statement holds so much power. All the power, I mean the power, what's powering this building right now, the power of the sun coming through that window. Everything that we can perceive in the colors of the light reflecting off of it, that's such a small area of the spectrum. There are many, many uh, radio waves, like radio waves, microwaves, infrared, optical, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays. All these things are considered light in the electromagnetic spectrum. And we only see a little. And I think that's to show us that we are fleshly. And God is spiritual. And when he created the heavens, I think there's spiritual heavens that are much greater than we'll ever perceive in the flesh. The things that are unseen, the invisible God, it's just God as the creator trying to give us a clue and a key to who he is and how great and awesome he really is. If you would go to John chapter 3. Go to John chapter 3. When God said, let there be light, he created all the energy that would ever be needed for everything to exist all the way to the last day. And I don't think we're going to run out of power. I think God will just... Uh, stop the music per se and, and he will uh, turn things off as he lights things up there is a judgment coming and we're all responsible for it there is a creator and we answer to him in John 1 of Jesus it says that he is the true light which lighteth every man that come into the world you understand that Jesus puts a light inside of you and you're born as a child and you have that light and how you respond to what is good and light with God I mean that is your heart listen salvation is of the heart it's a matter of how you respond to God and God says that Jesus is the one that made that light Jesus is the one that made you and he is that light he is the true light you're in John 3, look at verse 16, we all probably know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's Jesus, the son of God. He died for all of your sins. That whosoever believeth, that means anybody that trusts him for salvation, should not perish but have everlasting life. When God creates something, it will not end unless he wants it to. And when he gives us everlasting life, that is his promise that it will last forever. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Here's the promise that God will uh, give us that eternal life and light, and, and He is good in all that He has done. But uh, you say, well, then why won't men be saved? If we can see that there's a Creator, we see the creation, we see the design, why won't men choose to believe God? Look at verse 19. John 3, verse number 19. And this is the condemnation. He says, here's why we're guilty. That light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Here's what's interesting. You don't have to repent of your sins to be saved. Now, you need to repent and change your mind about trusting in Jesus to be saved. You don't have to uh, completely cease from your evil deeds. As long as you're in the flesh, there's evil in your flesh. But some men love their evil so much they would rather do evil than to receive the gift of eternal life. And that's what's sad. Sin is deceiving. Sin is destructive. The devil will ultimately cause men to fail as we see as we continue through Genesis. 
And listen, I want to make sure that your faith is strong in God. I want you to have great confidence that every molecule of you was created by Him, and your Creator died on a cross for your sins, and He has risen again, and He gives you victory if you'll trust Him. If you have that faith and you understand the power of the creation, you can better understand the power of salvation. A judgment is coming. God created the first day, and He will end it all on a last day. Yea, we will all have a last day on this earth. And if you're not right with God, by trusting in Jesus, then you have hell to pay. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You for the free gift of salvation. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we study through the book of Genesis. I pray that you would help us to have great faith in all that you have done. Lord, your creation is amazing. Lord, and your salvation is very merciful. Lord, we love you, and I just ask that you would help us to love each other and represent you well as we spend time on this earth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.